Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Noah Rafford, and I am the Chief Operating Officer and the Futurist in Chief for an organization called the Dubai Future Foundation. I was really looking forward to being with you there this morning in Singapore, but unfortunately, due to a last minute conflict, which I couldn't avoid, I'm not able to be there with you in person. Instead, I'd like to share this little video with you, which describes some of the activities and initiatives which we're doing in the UAE to help anticipate and create the future. And I hope you'll get in touch with me on my email address, which you can see here on the screen, or my Twitter account, and I'll share these with you again at the end of the presentation. I think we'll all agree that we're living in an era of transformational change. Not just transformational technological change, which is driven by increases and in advances in artificial intelligence, robotics, and automation, but also an era of social change. We're experiencing a growing gap between the rich and the poor, and this is manifesting itself in the form of anger and frustration by those who feel like they haven't benefited from the gains of the last 20 years, and indeed might not have a role to play in the gains of the next 20 years. We see this in forms of protests, both formal in terms of populist electoral politics and informal in the form of street protests and demonstrations, and unfortunately, in some cases, violence. This is all likely to continue to accelerate and be exacerbated by what many scientists agree to be the beginning of runaway climate change. As the effects of climate change deepen and accelerate, this is going to put more stress and strain on our social, economic, and ecological systems and make the questions which we'd like to explore today in this conference more profound and more pressing. So how do we, as government and civil servants, as public sector employees, how can we help to navigate this change? And not just navigate this change from a way of means of survival, but actually help to facilitate and bring about a more positive and optimistic vision of the world that we would like to live in and like to leave for our children. This is the question that we grapple with here in Dubai every day in the Dubai Future Foundation. And Dubai itself is a great place to be exploring these questions because Dubai uh, is a young city. The UAE itself is quite a young country. It's less than 45 years old. And it's no stranger to change. In the last 45 years, uh, the country has gone from having less than 50 college graduates in the whole country to having one of the highest educational attainment rates in the region, to having one of the highest GDPs per capita in the world, and to becoming a real test bed for integrating the technologies, infrastructures, and systems of the 20th century with the risks, opportunities, and potentials of the 21st century. So at the Dubai Future Foundation, our job is to ask this question. What does the next 20 years look like? If we've seen this amount of dramatic change in the last 20 years, and the rate of change is accelerating, then what do the next 20 years look like? And how can we help the UAE, the region, and the world prepare for it? So we do this through several ways. The first is through large-scale public engagement, and indeed not just engagement, but attempts to, in, to inspire optimistic views of the future, to have rich dialogues around what the promises and potentials of these technologies and these changes and business models and governance structures might hold. Instead of just writing a report, we explore how these fundamental human needs that are primarily the responsibility of the public sector, highly regulated things like education, healthcare, and transportation, how these intersect with technologies such as AI, robotics, synthetic biology, and distributed systems like blockchain. And we do so by creating these immersive interactive experiences, which you can actually walk into, you can touch, you can feel and experience. We've done this now five years in a row as temporary pop-up exhibits at an event called the World Government Summit, which we host each year in Dubai uh, in February. And this has given us the momentum the con and the confidence and the experience to build a permanent museum, which is currently under construction right now and will open in summer of 2019. Now, what's interesting about this, and I'd like you to consider, is, is this element of how we approach these questions and how we engage people. Take this example here. This is a fictitious hypothetical, speculative public healthcare system of the future. But it's not just a beautiful home health experience where as you brush your teeth in the morning and as you brush your hair and get ready for your daily routine, ubiquitous smart sensors scan you and your environment. They link with an AI doctor and with your health uh, history and it provides holistic preventative recommendations for how you might increase your wellness or decrease the risk of disease. But it actually envisions an entirely new system and it does so in a way which you, anyone really who experiences this exhibit, 
doesn't even need to know anything about AI. You might not even be a health expert. But as humans, we all experience the experience of getting up in the morning and getting ready for our day, of brushing our hair, of washing our teeth, and washing our hands, and taking a shower. And by creating this human-centric, immersive experiential approach, which shows how our daily needs, like healthcare, like education, might transform, we're able to not just present an exploratory vision for what the future might be like, but actually a specifically targeted, optimistic one, an optimistic vision which people actually want. This is really engaging. So as a policy briefer, you can spend years trying to brief the public or senior, senior civil servants on the ethical questions of big data, the, the social questions around surveillance and who's reading our data. But when you go and experience this in the context of a first person view with you and your mirror, and the thing is scanning you as we demonstrate here, just through a fictitious example of someone scanning their hand to check into their smart mirror in the morning and get a daily checkup, you feel it in your bones. You feel, what would it be like if my mirror was actually looking back at me and evaluating me? And this provokes questions from everyone in society. If you're a public health specialist, if you're a minister, or if you're even just a visitor to this experience, who's scanning me? Who's reading my data? Provokes a, provokes a visceral, emotional, physical response. This is a far more effective way of engaging people in conversations about the future. But it also generates demand. So take this example. This is a, a classroom of the future, an early childhood classroom of the future. It's a digital sand table that we developed. Uh, it's a fictitious experience. It works there. You can touch it and play with it. But it's based on the latest research on how children learn. We know children learn best in groups, interactive, engaging with different topics and material by literally getting their hands dirty, by experimenting, not by sitting and learning from a textbook or, or hearing big words about geology or geography or hydrology. So what this digital sand table shows is that you can build up little mountains of sand and digital snow forms at the top of the mountain. If you wave your hand, digital water falls from your hand and creates lakes and rivers. As you dig ditches for the lakes and rivers, it flows together and you begin to develop an emotional, physical understanding in a group of how water interacts in the environment. You begin to understand what geology is like and how it works in ge geography and hydrology and ecosystem science without ever having anyone tell you about it. And this is not only uh, educational and effective, but also it's beautiful. This is an experience that we had in the very first Museum of the Future that we did five years ago, where we we're taking the Prime Minister through the exhibit and the Minister of Education. And he looked at me and thought, oh, this is great. I get this. Uh, I'll take 300 of them. I was thinking in my head, like, wait a second, this isn't real. This is about a future classroom. This is fictitious. And he looked at me like I was a silly one. He said, you know, build me 300 of these. And we realized in that moment that this sort of, of experiential future is, is tremendously influential because it develops a vision which people want to see realized. So once you create these bold visions of the future, you have to do something about them. It's not just enough to talk about them, to envision them and visualize them through new media. You actually have to do something. You have to prototype things through experiments and pilot projects. So an example which I'm showing you here, it comes from uh, the role that 3D printing might play in architecture, real estate, and construction. We'd created an industry association in Dubai about two years ago to explore how one of Dubai's major economic sectors, construction and real estate, might be transformed by automation in the form of 3D printing. And out of this group, a uh, joint venture was formed that proposed the creation of the world's first 3D printed building. You can see it here. This is a 3D printed concrete. The walls, floors, and ceilings are all printed. And then we augmented that with different forms of, uh, of interior and exterior architecture. So it became the world's first fully functional 3D printed building. And it was indeed our office for several months. What's interesting about this is not the building itself, but that it's a real world prototype. It's a bold prototype that captures people's imaginations and develops a whole host of tacit knowledge which you can only gain through trying things out. This is a big prototype, but prototypes can be, quite, can be quite small as well. The point is, once you create an inspiring vision about the future, such as we do with the Museum of the Future, you have to help realize that vision by creating prototypes, tests, and real-world examples. This is what we've done here on the back of the three, opening of the 3D printed office. You can see this here. We worked with the, our municipal government to create a 3D printing strategy for architecture and construction. 
so it commits the city of Dubai to having 25% of all buildings 3D printed by 2030. That means that starting in 2019, you won't be able to get a building permit unless 2% of your building is 3D printed. And we'll increase that target every year 2% until we meet the goal. We've done the same with self-driving vehicles. We have a target of 25% autonomous of all trips will be autonomous by 2030. That's 15 years from now. I think we're going to beat that. But as far as I know, we're the only city in the world that has such an explicit and aggressive autonomous transportation target. And once you develop these prototypes, once you demonstrate these initiatives, it's important that you then create markets around them to help inspire others to come and want to realize that vision. People such as 3D printing companies, such as self-driving car companies, such as neutral modes of transportation or security. And we do this through several means. The first of which is an example here through a program that we call the Dubai Future Accelerators. This is quite interesting because this is, I think, one of the only accelerators in the world by government which doesn't take any equity in your company. It develops bold challenges for what each government department might face in the coming 10 years. And then it attracts companies from around the world, small companies, small and large, to come demonstrate their technology and spend nine weeks with us developing a pilot project proposal. So this is how we're institutionalizing this process of envisioning the future, creating, creating projects and proposals from that, and then realizing them in the form of prototypes. A good example of how we create markets is around blockchain. So after creating the Global Blockchain Council, which was one of the one of the first and largest multi-party coalitions of banks, regulators, multinational technology companies, and startups around blockchain, we started developing a series of pilot projects. And after developing these pilot projects, the industry came to us and said, what's the roadmap here? What's the way forward? So working on the strategic potential of blockchain, we worked with our partners in the Smart Dubai office and other government departments to create a bold and ambitious target, such as putting 100% of all government transactions on the blockchain by the year 2020. And this is attracting the best and the brightest blockchain enthusiasts and companies from IBM to Microsoft to Consensus to a dozen other small companies to come and help realize this vision. So Dubai in a period of 18 months has gone from being nothing on the blockchain map to being one of the global centers of blockchain development and testing. So these are just a couple of examples to show how we help to work with the public sector, with our partners and other government departments, with the private sector and with the public itself to envision bold, creative, aspirational visions of the future, to test them out through prototypes, to scale them up by creating markets around them, and then to invest in them through direct contracts and direct investment. I hope this has been helpful and useful to you, but regardless of where you are, there's one thing that's for sure. We're going to experience dramatic disruption in the coming years. From AI to climate change and social inequality, no government is safe. No industry is safe. Nothing is going to be stable. And we can have two ways of approaching this, either a hopeful, optimistic, and experimental approach, or a fearful, regressive, defensive approach. And I think that the winners in the 21st century are going to be those who are able to continually experiment and test with test these, tri these trials out and create a hopeful narrative and a hopeful vision, which encourage people to take part in the creation of that future. So hopefully this has been helpful for you. Again, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Please do get in touch with me here on my email address or my Twitter account below. Uh, I regret that I'm not there in person to share some ideas and experiences with you. But thank you so much for your time and attention. And I look forward to being in touch with you.